Okay, Marianne, shall we? We shall. It's great to see everyone. Good evening and welcome to Democracy in America. This is the virtual partnership between the New Haven Free Public Library and Public Humanities at Yale. I'm so excited to announce the continuation of this program. We've been long-term partners and um, I'm so happy that Professor, Professor Matt Jacobson is back and he'll be interviewing Adrienne Jefferson from Cultural Affairs of the City of New Haven. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Welcome everybody, it's great to see you here. I'm Matthew Jacobson. I'm the acting co-director of the Public Humanities at Yale. Delighted to be back in this space with our, our colleagues from the New Haven Free Public Library. Thank you so much to Marianne Huggins, Luis Chavez Brumel, Seth Godfrey, Rory Mortarana, Isaac Shubb, Delaney Kelly, and all of our other friends over at the New Haven Free Public Library. This has been a really important partnership for us and we're really happy to be continuing it this year. Thanks too to my colleague, uh, Karen Rothman, who's worked so hard on this series and on this event and our associate Jake Gagne, who's working even now as we speak on the back end of this webinar. Thank you, Jake, for all the work that you do. One program note before we get started, our next program will be Tuesday, November 15th at seven o'clock. Our colleague Elena, Elihu Rubin from uh, the Architecture School and American Studies at Yale will be speaking. Uh, the title of his session is Spaces for Democracy the Gough Street Armory as Civic Infrastructure. So we'll be talking about historic preservation, preservation in general, land, space, place, and democracy. So please join us for that November 15th. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome Adrian Jefferson. Adrian is the Director of Cultural Affairs for the City of New Haven and the Executive Director of New Haven Festivals Incorporated where she's leading the city on cultural equity and anti-racism initiatives. Adrienne and her department have created the Arts for Anti-Racism Pledge, the Unapologetically Radical Conference, and the City of New Haven and State of Connecticut's first ever cultural equity plan, which we'll be discussing tonight. Prior to her current role, she served as an arts program manager for Connecticut's Department of Economic and Community Development in the Office of the Arts where she developed groundbreaking programs such as the Arts Workforce Initiative, Paid Employment Program, and the Relevance, Equity, Access, Diversity, and Inclusion Music Conference, which has placed hundreds of young creative workers of color in arts jobs and professional development opportunities across the state. As part of Adrian's most recent work with the City of New Haven, she oversees the city's membership in the Government Alliance of Race and Equity, and has formed the Core Race Equity Task Force, She's also a member of the Closing Gaps Network, Living Cities Initiative, which pr provides ongoing leadership training on community organizing, anti-racism principles, equity assessments, and capacity building. She oversees the Civic Space, which is a multi-pronged civic engagement platform where community members communicate directly with city officials on the changes they wish to see in their neighborhoods. Adrian has an MA in Arts Administration from Savannah College of Arts and Design. She currently serves as a councilwoman for the State of Connecticut Arts Council, an advisory board member for New England Foundation for the Arts, and as ex officio board member for the Schubert Theater. She's received the 40 Under 40 Award from the Urban Professional Network and the 40 Under 40 Award from the Connecticut Magazine. As you can hear, she is an incredibly busy person, and we are so grateful that Adrian has taken the time to visit with us tonight. Welcome, Adrian Jefferson. It's so great to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Busy, but not too busy to be here tonight, to be here with you. I'm looking forward to our conversation, um, and I just want to thank you for having me. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just start by sharing my screen and going through a brief presentation about cultural equity and the work that we've been doing in the city of New Haven. Um, and then after that, I know we're going to be in conversation. So I wanted to, um, I found it really important to be able to present tonight about cultural equity and really to give the foundation of how this work came to be in the city of New Haven. I think uh, the first thing that's very important, and honestly, it's probably the most fundament fundamental thing to, to understand, is that this was a call from the community. 
the cultural equity plan, the cultural equity idea was not something that was birthed from my head. It actually came out of a conversation that um, Mayor Elliker had when he was transitioning into the position as mayor. He did a, a series of round tables with the community and one of them focused on arts and culture. And what we heard in that transition round table conversation repeatedly was a call for anti-racism in the arts, for more equity and access and inclusion in the, to, that reach the neighborhoods and not just downtown, but they reach all the pockets of the different neighborhoods in New Haven and for like the different art forms that were not currently being recognized to be, to be uplifted and to have, to have a platform to shine. And it was really clear that what the community was calling for was a cultural equity plan. So I get asked a lot why we chose a cultural equity plan versus a cultural plan. And, and you will find in most cities, most cities, especially major cities, they do have what is called a cultural plan. A cultural plan looks at cultural vitality. It looks at economic development and economic growth through the arts, economic revenue, and they might touch upon diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they don't center it in their plans. A cultural equity plan centers marginalized groups of people, and they talk about what it looks like to really look at social implications and being able to use arts and culture to make sure that people have a better quality of life. And so it does almost the opposite. So it still touches upon economic development, it still touches upon cultural vitality, but through the lens of how we make it benefit marginalized groups of people, specifically black and brown people. So briefly, I pulled a few slides from out of the actual plan, just to, to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Because I, again, I do get asked a lot, well, why cultural equity? So we believe that cultural equity is a, a quality of life issue, meaning that everyone should have access and is deserving of having access to the arts. We also believe that it's a domino effect. So even though we might be centering a lot of our attention on equity, specifically in marginalized communities, what happens is when you empower that community, all other communities are empowered. The other thing is that it's an economic issue. And in, in order to understand why it's an economic issue, you have to really understand the, the contribution of arts and culture when it comes to finances. We are literally a multi-billion dollar industry, $5.7 billion come into the state of Connecticut through arts and culture dollars, um, especially when it integrates and intersects with other sectors. We bring in 57,000 jobs in the state of Connecticut alone in arts and culture. But when you look at that number, with those numbers, and you look at the revenue, that revenue is mostly not reaching Black and Brown communities. So what we're saying here is that if you're able to identify and reroute that money into the communities, we actually can have a seat at the table when it comes to helping to close the racial wealth gap. And again, it's a survival issue, right? We believe that communities should be thriving. They should be thriving. Everyone should be able to have a high quality of life. And um, it's an ecosystem issue, which goes back to the domino effect that I spoke about earlier. And there's a lot of other benefits of cultural equity, but those are the ones that I like to pinpoint the most because sometimes you have to just point people to the data. Like some people just are not gonna get why this is important, but I, the data never lies. Now, um, the most fundamental piece, and I'll go back to this, and I'll probably say this over and over tonight, but is that this started with the people. This is really a manifesto, a document that represents what majority of the people in New Haven, in the arts community and outside of the arts community wanted to see. They wanted to see change. So this was a process that started with deep listening. We had to come to the table um, and talk to our community advisory members, our community board, which I'll explain how that came together a little bit later. But we had to say, listen, we, we, we want to do this plan. What do you feel about this? And where do we begin? And the one thing that we kept he hearing was we need to be able to be in a space where we can tell the truth. There's a lot of harm that we feel has been done by the city 
that has been done by institutions like Yale, that has been done by arts organizations, um, especially a lot of the, the anchor organizations, there was a lot of harm that had not been addressed. And they wanted to have a space, they being our advisory board members, which is our co-creation team who helped to write the plan. They wanted to be able to talk about these things. Um, we had to be flexible, right? We had a timeline where we thought, we were really ambitious and we thought we were gonna get this done in a year. It actually ended up taking us a little over, over uh, two years. But a part of that reason, outside of the fact that we were in the pandemic, was the fact that they were saying, we need more time. This feels rushed. I don't wanna feel a part of an, un, an unauthentic process that's just checking boxes. I wanna do the work. And to do the work, we have to dive deep into the roots and into the problems so that we can garner solutions that are real and effective to the communities that, that we seek to serve. We also had to share a lot of power. Um, the process itself, and I'll explain it in my next slide, but the process itself was not, you know, me coming in as the city official saying, this is the way it needed to be done. It actually was me coming to the table, sharing power with our partners, with our community advisors and saying, in what spaces and in what ways do I need to empower you to do this work? And do I need to step back? And a lot of the time, we had our co-creation members and our advisory board members doing the work amongst themselves and me just coming in on an advisory level. And that's something that, you know, it's a power struggle. It's not, especially in government, it's not always easy to do that type of process when we're, when we're taught so much to hold control of that mantle. So we had to let go and we had to be able to trust our community to do the work. This is just a little bit more about just just in case people are interested on in regular processes on exactly what the steps were that we did to get to the cultural equity plan, we it looked just like this. We hired consultants. We worked with the Civic Impact Lab from out of New Haven. So Elizabeth Nearing, Johnny Chivalry, and Eric Ray, who are from New Haven. They're anti-racist, anti-bias in their work. And we felt like it was really important, number one, to have lead consultants that were from the city of New Haven. And also people that were clearly stating that they're anti-racist, that that's the work that they're looking to do. So we worked with them and we also worked with Hester Street. Hester Street helped New York City do their cultural plan. And so they had the experience of working on strategic planning processes in, in culture and in, in somewhat in cultural equity. So we combined them together to give ourselves kind of like a dream team. Based up, off of that, we then came together with our partners from the Arts Council of Greater New Haven. And we said, what we wanna do is hire consultants from the community. We wanna hire residents, artists, activists, uh, food justice leaders, and different community leaders to be at the table. We wanna pay them for their time, just like we would any other consultant. And we wanna make sure that their voices are the ones leading this plan. And so we were able to develop who that team would be by working with our consultants. And then we had like some of the regular processes like research and asset mapping, really thinking about what cultural institutions are in the city of New Haven, traditional and non-traditional, black and brown and, and all different types of um, different diverse cultural assets that we have that sometimes don't make it on these lists. We wanted to make sure that we were being very reflective and, and truly reflective of our community. Um, we had community meetings and conversations and we, we talked to a lot of our stakeholders. One thing I will tell you that I found really interesting, we did a couple of town halls and in those town halls, we were getting primarily a demographic of, of white people coming into those spaces. And so again, this is supposed to be a cultural equity plan that really is reflective of the diversity of our city. And what we realized is that there's a lot of people who are just not gonna show up into these meetings. We have to go to them. We have to do you know, canvassing in the community. We have to have affinity group spaces in the neighborhoods and in other aspects of the community where people feel like they belong. And so we had to take a few steps back and really um, hold ourselves accountable to setting up spaces of belonging that allowed us to build with our community and get true feedback. And so again, that's kind of where the flexibility came in with being fluid and changing the dynamic of the work. We did online surveys, we did you know, a lot of analysis work, and we did a lot of reimagining. You know, we came back to the table quite a few times um, with a draft, 
And the draft was created by the co-creation team. I did not write this plan. So I just want to clarify, I did not write the plan. I have components that I contributed to the plan. My department had components. The consultants did as well, but the community wrote this plan. So this truly is a document for and by the community. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is that this is, this is now true art policy. So this was approved by the mayor. This was approved by the Cultural Affairs Commission, which is, um, they're appointed by the Board of Alders. So this is an official document that we can use for advancing racial equity and advancing equity of other marginalized groups in our city. And I wanna talk a little bit about, these are images from the, from the press conference when we announced. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I, what I find is really important in doing this work. And I, and I think the biggest thing is listening. Like we have to listen and we have to listen in, in ways where we're not defensive and ways where we're not constantly pushing back on our community. It really takes us being able to center ourselves in a humble way and get rid of our egos so that we're able to hear real feedback and, and implement a responsiveness in a way that's gonna benefit our community. Building trust is, is very important. I cannot say that enough. And also being able to rethink power. So I, um, when, we're, when we're doing strategic processes and planning, like something like this for the city, we really don't have to do it through the traditional lenses that we always do strategic planning. It can be different. And this, and this process allowed us to challenge gatekeeping in a process that sometimes is all about gatekeeping. So um, that's kind of what I would say is the importance of including the community. And also, if you're ever gonna include the community, they must be paid for their time because their expertise, their knowledge, it matters. I wanted to talk a little bit about just some of our programs before I wrap up and get to talk to, to Matt. Just some of, some of our programs. So what does cultural equity look like in real time, right? So it was really important to us that we didn't just have a cultural equity plan that sits on a shelf. So when you read this plan, the first thing that's gonna jump out at you is the fact that embedded in the plan is activities. Activities that are thought provoking, that, that cause you to, ch to challenge yourselves, to challenge the status quo, to challenge the norms and ask yourself the deeper questions about what role we play in, in, in being complicit in white supremacy culture. Really, that's, that's the question, right? What roles are you playing in, in any type of inequity? And that's for all people from all walks of life because our belief is everyone plays a role in the system. And so once we acknowledge that, we can undo those things. So I will say it is a living document, but also in tangible ways with our programs and the things we have in place, what does cultural, actual, cultural equity actually look like in action? And so I just wanted to show y'all a few models. So we have this program called the Neighborhood Culturally, Cultural Vitality Grant Program. Some of you might be familiar with this program because it's been around for quite some time. It used to be called the Mayor's Neighborhood Vitality Grant Program, and it's gone through a lot of different renditions through the years. This program has gone through a complete overhaul, and it's all based on the cultural equity plan. What we did was we got more funding and resources so that we can give out more money, and we also decided to change the program categories and to lower the barrier to access so that more people, including individual artists, individual curators, and event planners, and community organizers can enter into the program and can have access. The grant itself, it was easy to write. It's not long with all the paperwork. It really is just the basics. And I think that's really important to acknowledge because philanthropy itself sometimes can be a barrier, um, although it's supposed to help people. Another thing that we have done that is aligned to cultural equity, it actually predates the cultural equity plan and it's the American Rescue Plan efforts. So um, many of you may know we have received money uh, from the American Rescue Plan, the ARPA dollars. And we did have a series of different community focus groups where the community was able to advocate and talk about where they wanted to see that allocation go. And um, we did not create any program specifically in arts and culture that was not based off of direct feedback and civic engagement 
from the community. Another example, the Creative Sector Relief Fund. I think this is such a good example because this is the closest that we have gotten so far in the city of New Haven to universal funding. This is a concept of universal funding, um, a concept of reparations for black and brown artists who, who have struggled since the pandemic, whose, whose inequities were exacerbated after the pandemic. We wanted to create a, a grant program that would give them unrestricted dollars in the amount of $10,000 to be able to live, to be able to do their artwork, to be able to um, be responsive to their community and not have to worry about the bills, at least for a few months. We have created the Unapologetically Rad Radical um, Conference. This conference is all about where arts and culture intersects with social justice. We um, have been able to give so many artists, particularly in New Haven, a platform to use their voices to talk about anti-gentrification, to talk about buying back the block, to talk about civic engagement and social unrest and the role that the artists and the black and brown community can play in their own liberation. And so this conference has been two years in the making and we were able to bring in a keynote speaker, Tamika D. Mallory, who some of you may know. Now this I am extremely proud of. We were able to do, uh, just this summer, we did the inaugural Black Wall Street Festival. And many of you may know that Black Wall Streets traditionally were Black business districts. And we really wanted to bring back that concept that would commemorate our history when it comes to Black Wall Street, but also to deal with right now, today, the, um, the wealth oppression that so many people in the Black community face and be able to pour into them through revitalization and economic development that would allow Black businesses to thrive and begin to make money. And, and this was a, a very successful event that happened this summer. The feedback was tremendous. We will be doing this again. We also did, so this is the picture from the entrepreneur party that we did. We, um, we have been talking a lot about the barriers that exist in entrepreneurship and small business. Um, there are programs, many programs that are out there that are great programs that support black and brown businesses, uh, but the barrier to access is really high. And so we wanted to really do something that's more for the emerging young black and brown professional who really is just getting started but needed access to networking and to knowing who the people are that they should be talking to um, and just being able to set the platform. And we had some performances, so that's why. I showed that picture. We've been helping groups like Black Haven um, set up pop-up spaces, Black liberation pop-up spaces that are for healing and events and other cultural activities. And um, the last example I will put here is narrative-based change making, right? Changing the narrative and being able to work with a lot of artists and community members on, on taking back and reclaiming their narratives and using their voices and their platform to amplify social change. During the pandemic, um, obviously we all know there were a lot of hotspots, hotspot communities. And primarily in those hotspot communities, we were finding that young people were not wearing masks. So what we did was partner with the health department, we partnered with the mayor's office, and we worked in partnership with about 10 to 12, I think it was 10 actually, 10 community-based artists to utilize their voice to be on billboards and buses and on other um, assets all throughout the city to spread the message of masking up. This was a, a very effective campaign that really shows when you center cultural equity, how it intersects with other things such as public health. So yeah, so that's it. I'm gonna stop here. There's so much more that I can say, but I think that that gives you a really good glimpse into some of the work we're doing and to what cultural equity actually is. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can find it. Okay, there we go. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Adrian. It's so exciting and it's it's so ambitious. It's such an ambitious plan. It's, uh, it's really great to see it. I mean, one of the things that's so striking to me is that um, the way that democracy is kind of woven into it in such a fundamental way, the democracy in some sense is the point 
of the mm -hmm. plan. I mean, it, it's that's what the plan will deliver, actually, right? Is democracy in the sense of equity, distribution of resources, inclusion, um, anti-racism. I mean, all the things that go along with a healthy democracy are things that will be delivered by this plan. But the plan, democracy is also, in some sense, the precondition for the plan. Your process, yeah. your, your process is a completely democratic one. And so you're enacting democracy even while you're working towards it. And it just seems like a brilliant model to me. Can you say a little bit more about your thinking on that and how that model took shape. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you with you more. And I know we were talking a little bit before this started and it really, first of all, I'm glad that that's what resonates, right? Because this was really important that this really showed that the people took ownership from the beginning of this plan. You know, there are so many times where we have processes and then we want to include the community later as an afterthought and get their feedback on what they think about all of the foundational work that was already laid. And it was important to us that this wasn't something that we were just creating, but it's something that they actually took ownership in at a foundational level and that we censored that. You know, I think that um, for us, the process actually was more important than the outcome. Right. And it was about, you know, it really was about that. It was, how can we do this different, right? If we say we're going to do the work of cultural equity, if we say we're going to dismantle systems, why would we do things the same old way it's always been done? Because clearly there's something wrong with that system too. So what we said is we need to filter this entire plan, including the process and the thought behind the process through a race equity filter or through a filter of equity period. And, and that meant that we had to start about like, how do we make this a process that really includes the community that it's for, right? We also didn't want to play like savior, right? There is, of course, there is, and obviously I'm not a white woman, but there is like, you know, savior syndrome that happens sometimes in white communities. But furthermore, even with the class, you know, class level and also with like in positions like mine, like governmental positions or high leadership positions in institutions where you come in and you gatekeep and, and you kind of control the whole scenario, right? So we really wanted people, you know, it was really important for us to build trust. I mean, that's yeah. the truth. And we already knew that we were coming into this where there was a major distrust, right? It doesn't matter if some people knew me and liked me, there was still a distrust for the city and the intentions for the plan. So how do we build trust and show that this process is meant to be authentic? Well, we change the whole process, right? And we make sure that it is about democracy, that it is about hearing the voices of the people, but not just that, it's about giving the power back to the people. Because at the end yeah. of the day, you know, I think we do true democracy, real democracy, it belongs to the people. It's, it's not really ran by institutions. Right. So that's, that's what our intention really was. And I think it became more clear even for us, as we were in the process itself, you know, like when the community was like, when our community advisory board, our co-creation team was like, this process is, feels rushed, right? It doesn't feel authentic. We right. need to, talk. like that checked us and held us accountable. Yeah. I imagine that the learning curve was incredibly steep at, at certain moments in this where you had to, you had to shift gears, you had to change direction, you had to, you, in, in your listening you were hearing things that maybe you hadn't been prepared for that you needed to to take in and and encompass in your own planning and your own kind of thinking. Can you walk us through a little bit of your own process and maybe what some of those aha moments were? What were some of the real turning points where you you felt like, oh, I'm being schooled. I now I'm I'm really I'm, I'm really understanding this in a new way. Do you know what's so crazy? Um, those aha moments for me actually came prior to us having the cultural equity plan and prior to us being in the actual official process for the plan. So, um, you know, I say this all the time for us, cultural equity planning really started the day I walked into that office, February 3rd, 2020. And this was before we actually sat down with anybody and, and did any type of planning for the plan, right? We didn't do anything. It was just like, we're going to come in unapologetic and do the work. And during that time, you know, right after that, the pandemic hit. And so when the pandemic hit, I think there was there were two things that really um, came to be. And it was just that we cannot wait until the pandemic passes to, to start to do cultural equity. We cannot wait until we have a full plan to do cultural equity. 
we need to do cultural equity right now. It has to be action right now because people's lives are depending on it right now. So actually the real challenge was thinking about what are ways we can activate cultural equity without a plan, right? And um, that's where a lot of our programs were birthed. So the Creative Sector Relief Fund actually came before we had a plan. The Unapologetically Radical Conference actually came before we had a plan. So there are things that we just really could not wait for, but again, because, you know, I'll tell you this, a friend of mine said this, and it's really so simple, but so profound. And she said, you know, there are so many people who get to sit in coffee shops and have conversations about race equity or equity, but there's other people who are dying in the streets and they don't have time for us to sit in coffee shops and wait. And that has always kind of like resonated with me. And that actually was my first aha moment. My um, second aha moment was when we, when we partnered with um, Black Lives Matter New Haven to paint Black Lives Matter on the street after the murder of George Floyd. And so if you remember during that time, there was a, a influx of solidarity statements. There was you know, people who were painting Black Lives Matter all over the, the, the streets, most of them in front of city hall all throughout the nation. And so we wanted, you know, we had people who came to us about doing the same thing. And so we kind of jumped at the opportunity to go paint Black Lives Matter in the streets. And um, somebody said, you know, before you do that, you really need to talk to Black Lives Matter in New Haven. Like you really need to have a conversation. And when I spoke to them, one of the first things that, um, and they're great friends of mine, all of them. Um, but one of the first thing that somebody said to me was, um, who told you we wanted you to do that? right? Mm -hmm. Who who said that that's what we wanted? And, and who said that that's where we wanted? That location you selected, who said that's where we wanted? It? And it really caused me to like step back and say, you know what? You're right. Why did we decide, you know, that we were going to do this and do it in front of City Hall like everyone else? Why didn't we first talk to our community? So we had to back up. We had to take advising from them. And honestly, we had to just kind of step back and just provide the resources and let them take over the process. Mm -hmm. And that was a true, um, that was a true turning point for me. Yeah, so would you go so far as to say that that initial distrust actually was, became an asset for you? Mm. Yes, it did. <laughs> it, it was an asset. The, I think um, it was the truth telling, right? It was the truth telling from, from members of my community. It was um, realizing that even though I'm a black woman, a young black woman, doesn't mean I can just go into neighborhoods thinking I know what's best too, right? And there, there is a respect process here, right? And I also think it taught me how to work with community better. And the, the main thing was to listen. And it was to listen and to really hear, not just to like yeah. listen as a formality, but to really hear and be able to take myself out of the process or to take my department out of the process and really just be a, a supporting factor of the work that already was happening. Like that's a, a thing that's important to acknowledge. There's work that's lifted in the cultural equity plan. That's work of people who have been in this community for years. And this work has already been happening. Movement work, change work, activism. That's not stuff we could take credit for. And we won't take credit for. We just wanted to make sure that we were clear about our intentions in this plan to drive that work home, right? And I think that that's what I've, that's what I've learned and that's what's been a benefit to, to me. Yeah, yeah. I want to invite our audience to submit questions, either use the Q&A or the chat function. Um, Adrian and I will keep chatting, but we have plenty of time for other questions. And I'm sure uh, we have some very August, August uh, members of the community are on the, on the line here. And I'm sure you have comments and questions of your own. So we're eager to field those. Um, I wonder, I would love to hear you just reflect a little bit on, on New Haven as a place. It's a, on the one hand, I, I mean, it's a very special place. I think that many of us who live here think of it as a very special place. And I think you captured that in some of the photographs that you just showed us. It's also a place, I think there are many of us who think of it as a place where democracy maybe isn't as robust and healthy as it might be. Mm. And that it's a challenging place. And I just, I would love to hear you talk about the specificity not just doing um, culture, cultural equity work in an urban center in the United States in 2022, but specifically in New Haven, what have been some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that this place offers? Mm, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's funny because I actually reflect on this quite a lot. Um, 
I think New Haven, I will talk about like the benefits, what I think is so beautiful. First of all, um, I have never lived in a place or worked in a place where people care as much as they do in the city of New Haven. Everybody you encounter or that I have encountered is passionate. They are civically involved or they want to be civically involved. They have strong opinions. They have a love for the history of New Haven and their involvement. Everywhere I go, I get a, a history lesson, especially from folks who are probably about like 50 and older, I get really deep, rich history lessons. And so right away, I knew that New Haven was a beautiful place. I also think that with New Haven, you get community. So you get the city side, but you get community. Everything's tight knit. Everyone kind of knows each other. So I think that that's great. I think the challenge is also that kind of everyone knows each other, right? <laughs> like that can be a challenge. Um, I think if I'm being honest, the biggest challenge I've seen is that there are a lot of people in New Haven who do not want to pass the baton. And there is an, uh, there is an intergenerational disconnect between our brilliant um, older folks who have just been carrying this mantle and the new generation who's coming in with new innovative ideas and they, they want to contribute to, there is a, a head on like collision. And it is something like I have never seen anywhere else. Mm. I do not know what the basis of that is, where it comes from, but I hear it and I hear it on both ends. I hear it from the younger people who are like, I really feel like, you know, my voice is not heard here. I really feel like, you know, like the mantle's not being passed, like the torch is not being passed, like I'm not empowered. I really don't know where I can find a mentor in this city because the people in power don't want to empower me, right? So I've heard that. And then from the older generation, I've, I've heard that they felt disrespected. They feel like people don't know about the deep history. So for me, I'm always thinking, well, the opportunity of this challenge is bridging that gap. So yeah, that, that would be the main thing that comes to my mind when I think about some of the challenges of New Haven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You talk in the in the um, document itself, you talk a lot about moving from plan to action, and that's that's really at the heart of it. Um, can you just tell us a little bit? I mean, you gave us some some of a glimpse of some of what the action has been, and it's very exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that are coming down the pike? Yeah, I can actually tell you about. So we have so much, <laughs> but I could talk a little bit about um, what if you have the plan in your hand, if you actually have a hard copy. The back of it says continue the work and continuing the work for us is very important. So immediately right after the plan, we launched a cultural equity tour. And so what we did was, especially because we just didn't want the, we don't want the idea to be that, oh, this is going to sit on the shelf. you like, or this is it's done, you know, box check. We were like, no, now we want to workshop it with our community. Now we want to learn like how we can evolve this document, how we can do it better. So we launched a, a tour. Um, the tour consisted of a workshop with the community and other stakeholders at Stetson Library. We also did a celebration event where we showed cultural equity in action at the State House. And then we also did a virtual um, component with our arts and cultural leaders, where they were talking about ways in which they are now implementing the plan in their work. Um, and um, really, this is also this is also a tie to the to the Arts for Anti-Racism pledge that we created in the midst of the George Floyd, you know, after George Floyd was tragically murdered, we had this pledge. And what a lot of people may not know is a lot of these arts and cultural institutions, majority of them in the city took this pledge. And they took a pledge to dismantle unequitable policies in their, in their organizations. So we now are taking this plan and through the idea of workshopping it, is taking it and holding arts organizations accountable through conversation, through looking at the work they've done over the last six months in a year to a year to really dismantle the policies that they said that they would do. So that's some of the work that we've um, been doing. In addition to that, there are things literally in the plan. We have been asked to create an accountability team. Um, so we, we weren't able to yet create that because we need additional resources, but we, are, we were able to bring on a cultural equity coordinator who has been helping us do a lot of this forward movement of keeping the plan alive. So that's just some of the stuff. And that's in addition to the programs that we're doing, which I really feel are the most effective. Great. Questions are starting to stream in. In fact, I, I'll, I'll do my best to get to all of them. They're, they're, it looks like we're gonna have a lot, but here's one just to follow up on what you just said. This is a, such a great question. 
Can you imagine forward 50 years from now, looking back at this plan as a seed or a set of seeds, what grew the tallest? Mm. Wow. You know, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think it's, it's really, for me, this is legacy building, right? This is, this is really, it supersedes a plan. It supersedes arts and culture. What will grow the tallest is when we're able to look into the neighborhoods such as Dixwell and New Hallville and see the businesses there thriving, seeing mm -hmm. people not suffering from gentrification, seeing people being able to actually take part in place keeping, not place making, and doing it in a way where we no longer need a strategy, where it's just be a part of the everyday work. It's just a part, it's embedded in who we are. That is the place we need to get to. So when I think back and like what this can do, like this being a foundation, where it can go and what this can do and what we would hope we it would wanna do is when we don't know, we no longer need a plan because that's, it's the norm. It's now the norm that everything is inclusive and equitable, equitable and people are thriving and growing. It's like the same way I feel about philanthropy. I think we have a major problem in philanthropy. I think that um, philanthropy in some ways, and I'm not knocking it, completely, but I think it's to keep the people who are oppressed, oppressed, to keep them needing more from the people who are their saviors, right? We need to dismantle those systems and people need to have direct access to resources that allow them to thrive independently. That is what I would like to look back on 10, 15 years from now and see that is happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's, uh, I'm just gonna, these questions are gonna be a little bit random, but they, they're all, they seem like great questions. Um, I love how you've expanded our concepts of art and culture and how important they are to our common life, to our shared humanity. What would you say to people or organizations that don't think of themselves as artists or arts organizations? How can they use this cultural equity plan? That's a great question. I, I think the, the most beautiful thing about the cultural equity plan is that it's universal. You literally can take the word arts out of everything, most everything in that plan, and you it's, it's implementable to every single organization. It's actually implemental, you can implement it to individuals as well. So you can literally be just a, a regular person who's not in arts and culture, who picks up this plan and should be able to still ask yourself the tough questions, still answer, you know, answer honestly, and still think about the role you want to play in your society. And so you don't have to, like, that's the thing, it's interchangeable. We're saying cultural equity, but it also can be like health equity, right? It can also be like food justice. It, it can be anything, climate change. All of these things intersect with cultural equity. And I think in order to get that, you have to really get the fundamental understanding of what cultural equity is. Cultural equity is just the vehicle, the, ve the vehicle to equitable systems change in every aspect that you can possibly think of, mobility, transportation, food, right? Being able to live, to, to have work and live at a healthy wage. It's all of those things. And we're saying that this is a new tool that you can use as a way to get those things done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, where do you begin with cultural and racial equity efforts when you're without power inside a powerful institution? Mm -hmm. at, at what level do you often see the most meaningful change take place or contributions toward cultural equity being made? Mm -hmm. Um, cultural equity and really anti-racism. Anti-racism and being anti-racist is an everyday decision. And it starts with yourself. It is literally something where you wake up and I believe it's in the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, where it is um, talked about so clearly. You do not wake up and you're just anti-racist. No one is, no one is, not me, not you, no one. We have to ask ourselves every day, we have to challenge ourselves every day and ask ourselves the tough questions on like, am I doing what's right in this moment? You know, is what I'm doing right now, you know, anti-racist or is it the opposite of that? That's what you can do. It's like holding our own selves accountable in the moment, right? So that means when you're in a room and maybe you don't have power, but maybe you're in a room with people who do, right? It's about not being silent about things that need to be spoken up about. It's about not being complicit because I believe silence is being complicit, right? So it's those things. It's challenging yourselves with the everyday moments. It's challenging the norms. Sometimes 
stepping out of being comfortable, right? And being able to say, you know what? I'm not used to doing this. Doesn't really feel like it's in my role to do this or, you know, in my scope, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put myself out there because I believe that and being anti-racist, I believe in equitable systems changed. Yeah, that kind of self-challenge is written into the equity plan too. For those of you who have never seen the plan, well, first of all, for those who, who have never seen the plan, where's the best place that they can access it? How can they find it? it? Is, so if you go to togethernewhaven.com and then you click on the arts and culture tab, there's a link for cultural equity. And actually, I think we have a link. As soon as you go to togethernewhaven.com, there might be a separate hyperlink just for the culture equity plan. Great. Together New Haven, as that's all one word, together yeah, new together newhaven.com. Com. Great. Thank you. For those of you who haven't seen the equity plan, there are kind of like worksheets bedded into it that that challenge you to really think about your place and what you're doing and what you're not doing and to imagine uh, to imagine what you might do differently. And it's it's a really challenging document in that way. Um, how did you arrive at that premise? Because it's very unusual for a kind of a government plan of this sort to include that kind of a, a workspace. Yeah, um, thank you for acknowledging that. Americans for the Arts, they told us this is the best cultural equity plan they've ever seen. And the reason they said that was because of it including the activities in, in the plan and the questions in the plan. And honestly, that came from our consultants, Civic Impact Lab, Hester Street, and our co-creation team. We had said to them, we being my department and the Arts Council of Greater New Haven, we had said to them, listen, we already know that people are going to say that this is just a document that's going to sit on the shelf. We want to make a statement. We don't know how, but we want to make a statement that when you, when you open this document, you know it is a living document. So we have been referring to it as a living, evolving, breathing document since the beginning. And so the way that manifested when they heard us say that is is um, the activities and the questions in the plan. Mm -hmm. Great. Here's another question from the audience. How can we make sure successful anti-racist cultural equity initiatives lead to bolder economic reinvestment efforts by city and state policymakers? Mm, how can we make sure? Well, I'm gonna tell you what I, th what I think. I think um, leadership has to change, right? And so this goes directly to getting people in office that represent not politics, but represent the community. It's um, a new change when we look at like civic engagement, when we look at, first of all, actually, let me take it a step back. It's education around civics, right? Because in order for us to garner those type of leaders, we need to be cultivating those type of leaders. And then in addition to that, we need to have pipeline into people who are interested in leadership, interested in politics, who may not be the norm, right? They're not the, the traditional candidates, right? They're not your normal politicians. That is what I really believe, especially on a governmental level, it, it takes change of leadership and it's the type of leadership we, we're not currently seeing across the board, right? So I think that. Another thing I think is, you know, there is, um, as you stated earlier, the city of New Haven has joined the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And it, systems like that are really important for governmental bodies to be able to actually have a roadmap to dismantling policies, especially policies that have been placed since the, since the existence of this country, right? We need to have something in place that gets us to undo the harm that's been done and to remedy a lot of these policies that are harming people. And so the Government Alliance on Race Equity, although not perfect, it's a great way to start. And so we really should be encouraging all governmental bodies to be a part of institutions and systems like that that are really focused on undoing in government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Here's another question from the audience. It's exactly the kind of question you always want to hear. How can surrounding communities partner or contribute to the work? Mm, so I think, I think it's twofold, right? Number one, read the plan. <laughs> like, I think reading the plan is really good. Like that's a good start. And the thing is with that, it sounds so basic, but because there is uh, it's a guidebook. That's why we said this is a, a conversation of this being a roadmap, you know, to cultural equity, because this literally is a guidebook to some of the work you can start to do, even if you don't know where to begin. I think um, it really starts, and I'll go back to the original question. I think it starts with internal work. I, I really do think it starts there. And I also think it starts with policy shifts. So thinking about, if you don't know anywhere to, to start within your organization, thinking about, you know, a race equity framework work of some sort that can be your filter, 
anything that you are thinking about changing in your organization needs to be ran through this filter. And once you run it through that filter, if it's not meeting the standard of equity, then you don't do it, right? It's that simple. So getting a race equity framework, being able to have some ideas of programs and different things you're trying to build up and running it through the filter is a great way to start. But I honestly think, I can't emphasize enough, when it starts with first yourself. Also, because I think they said community. Another thing is go into the community and get to know the community without an agenda. Don't come in to the community just because now you're trying to do a plan or, or you're trying to do this program that you think is going to save the world. How about just go into the community you wish to learn more about, you wish to be a part of, and truly and authentically embed yourself in that community without wanting something in return? Mm, that's great advice. Um, you mentioned at the outset that there are many cities that have cultural plans, but not cultural equity plans. Here you are a couple years into this work. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how you assess how things are going. Um, so I guess it's a two-part question. One is, are there things that are happening now on the ground in New Haven that, that would not be happening if this were merely a cultural plan? Like how, like how are we doing with this, with this cultural equity plan? And, and the second is, um, and I guess this is a kind of intermediate question towards that 50 years from now, what seeds are growing the tallest, but looking ahead, what are some of the, what are some of the markers that you're looking to hit that would, mm -hmm. that would tell you that the plan is accomplishing the work that you had hoped for it? Um, and I'll start with with that question and then move backwards. Um, I see more access to resources for all of our communities, right? People being able to actually have like dollars, like people being able to actually build businesses, people being able to actually revitalize their communities the way in which that they want to. I think that that has to be like the actual manifesto, right? So we know right now, for example, in the Dixwell area, you, we have um, Concat and Concorp that's doing the Dixwell Plaza, which is beautiful and amazing. And I believe it's gonna benefit so many people, so many residents who are currently in the Dixwell area, things like that, ownership from people in the community and empowering them. And, and we should see um, almost like things blossoming, blossoming, so just like that all across the city. That's what I would imagine, right? I can imagine um, Dixwell, for example, becoming a cultural heritage district where it is preserved and protected, you know, against developers coming in, outside developers coming in and, and taking up buildings and knocking things down and being able to like deteriorate these buildings, right? Being able to really honor what these neighborhoods are and what they mean to the community. Um, is the cultural equity plan doing what it should be doing? I, I think it definitely. It definitely is. Um, I think we're only at the beginning of it because the work never really stops, especially when you're doing this work. We're only scratching the surface. Right now, we're trying to be as bold and clear as we possibly can. I think it, you know, not, not everybody's on board. I think, it, to be quite honest, that rubs a lot of people wrong, right? But the people who are benefiting are a lot of Black and Brown, particularly younger and older, you know, creatives who feel like they finally have a voice. Like to me, that's the impact. It's not even just like the programs and who's showing up. It's it's what we're hearing from the community on how this is actually changing and benefiting their lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we, we're just running out of time. We need to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Our, we've covered an awful lot of ground. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to that you wanted to make sure that we talked about about this plan? Just, just hitting home that we're just beginning. You know, it's not, we're not, we're not saying we're the experts here. We're saying that we're working with our community. We're learning, we're growing. This is evolving. This is an evolving plan. And we're going to come back and kind of do a reassessment and an adjustment of the plan based off of, a, of like how things are going and what we could do better. But I think that's important to know that because there is a lot more work we need to do. There is a lot of other groups of people who still don't feel included. And we need to we need to make more efforts towards that. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned in your last answer, you talked a little bit about some of the pushback. Can you say a little bit more about what some of the obstacles are that are that you're working on right now? I think, I think the biggest thing is when you um, boldly say not, when we say not just marginalized groups, but we're un unapologetically saying like black and brown, um, that ruffles feathers because there are unfortunately 
so many people in our society who are anti-Black, right? And they will not admit that, right? But but they may be. And so when you say that, when you say that boldly, it's going, it's just gonna ruffle feathers and people are gonna be like, well, what about this group? And actually we do include all the groups, um, as many groups as we can of marginalized people. But I think that part of anti-racist work is centering black and brown folks. You cannot back down from that when you are doing this work. Um, so that is why I say, I think um, it does rub people the wrong way. Some people think we should just be doing arts and culture the traditional way, um, you know, arts for art's sake. I, I don't believe in that. I right. believe that the arts when used to its best ability is a mechanism for social change. I actually believe it is social change. Yeah. Adrian Jefferson, thank you so much. It's been a delight to talk to you. The work you're doing is so inspiring. It's it's really, um, it's a great project and it's great to see it coming out of the city hall, basically. <laughs> <You know? laughs> how, thank how, you how, so how, much. How, how really lucky appreciate. are we? How lucky are we? Um, I just want to point out to our audience, um, my my associate Jake Gagne has pasted into the chat the link to the to the um, to the document itself. So please click on that now, and you can access the document right here and now. Um, Adrian, thank you. Thanks again. It's really been wonderful to talk with you tonight. Thanks for taking the time with us. And one last reminder that our next program will be November fifteenth. I'll be talking to Elihu Rubin about the the Gough Street Armory and uh, the democratic and maybe some of the not so democratic practices around that site. So thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Don't forget that the pandemic is not over. Please be careful out there. And uh, have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again, Adrian. It was really great. No, it was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you both. Good night. Good night. Good night, Marion.